kind of coming on to now actually getting these things finalized. So we've had our verbal agreements, we've had our pre-agreements, we've done our uh, scouting or whatever. Um, coming to actually finalizing and signing the contracts then. First of all, how much... Uh, actually, I guess, I guess this question kind of does go back to the last topic a little bit, but how much does salary play a part then in where players are going? So take someone like Evy, for example. Mm -hmm. I'll let you say, he's he's had a good offer from, from DFM to stay in Japan. Clearly, he wants to move then to actually further his career competitively rather than just going for a good salary yes. so let's say he's made the decision to come to europe or maybe i don't know maybe he was considering north america as well but he's made that decision to move so how important is it then to get to pick a team based on the salary or if there's two teams offering diff you know slightly different salaries or similar <coughs> is he picking based on uh, the one that's slightly more or is he picking on the one that's based on the actual better roster or the one that's got a better chance yeah i, I mean i, I think so uh, generally i mean my advice is their agent is that i want you to be in the team that will allow you to progress your career and reach your your career goals the the the, the best the, the, be the best chances of that obviously however it is my duty to protect a player if i think they'll be an undercut by uh my experienced Japanese top laner that's been to multiple international tournaments, if he's being offered less than a uh, rookie top laner that did fairly well this last year's EU Masters, to me, that's not fair. Mm -hmm. And the market value or the value for me would then not be being reached by by the team. Uh, and it would be my duty to to ensure that he gets at least a fair pay deal, right? Obviously, I will always push to, to try and get my players a premium salary. I want them to get the most money possible because at the end of the day, they're going to retire at 25, 30 and, um, and need to think about what they do next. And I want them to retire with money in their bank rather than basically bankrupt. So, um, And that probably gets you paid uh, better as well. I, I well, presume. yeah. I, I mean, so again, we differ slightly to, to other agencies because, uh, I mean, I don't necessarily take a, a, a commission from what my players get i get a i get salaried uh as mm -hmm. opposed to so, some agents just take the direct commission as their salary almost my commissions go to uh, the agency yeah. right so so that doesn't necessarily influence where, where we're different is that doesn't influence my so i i can have uh, a player being offered 300 grand a year i could be how i could have the player being offered 250 grand a year I don't personally see more money for one than the other. I may get bonuses from my agency for um, my good work, right? And my, my, my players succeeding and, and bringing money to the agency, but I don't directly see that compensation. So that doesn't influence, for, for my personal gain, it doesn't influence my decision, right? It influences my decision because I want my client to gain, but it doesn't influence my decision for personal gain. And that's why the agency does it that way, which um, is a much better way than than just me taking commission and me sending him to the highest paid team because I, I want more money myself. Mm -hmm. So we don't do that. That's where we're slightly different to, again, some agencies. But salary for sure plays a part. I think if you are going to be asked to do the same job in two different places, but one job, one place is going to pay you twice as much money, it, it becomes a bit of a no-brainer that actually I, I can I can do the same here, but get paid twice as much for doing that and it's it's value twice as much in that sense then sure if the 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 kind of if you're joining a if you're going to pay more but join an almost guaranteed template project where your work is not going to stand out where your work is you're not going to get to show how good you are where you're not going to be valued as a, as a part of the team um then then the project takes precedence over over the salary of course but uh, Ultimately, the players have to be happy. Um, that, that's that's my aim, and I need to understand the transfer market and the the player value to understand if my player is getting a fair deal or a good deal. I don't. I, my, my aim is to never let my players get a bad deal, right? And mm -hmm. um, and that extends beyond salary into all the contract clauses. Nice. Right, so on in terms of the salary as well, one thing, um, maybe a good contrast or not good, maybe a contrast to. Uh, traditional sports in for example football you sign a salary so you i've joined a i've joined Tottenham hotspur they give me a three-year deal on uh 50 grand Thanks a week let's um mm. let's let's dream uh unless i choose to leave or you know i accepted uh, a move to a different club i'm getting every penny of that 
for those three years. Um, and even if they don't want me anymore, I can, as long as I fulfill my contractual obligations, so I turn up for training, I do any commercial stuff yeah. I have to, as long as I don't actively not do my job, they could stick me in the reserves. They could not play me for three years, but because they mm-hmm. signed me got that contract, I'd get all that money. Uh, someone like, for example, Gareth Bale at Real Madrid was on rumored like 600 grand a week. And they basically decided... Was a they, was. Yeah, <laughs> well, there you go, <laughs> piece of contract. And they basically, um, for what it seemed at the time, Real Madrid didn't want him anymore. Um, and they were paying him silly money, yeah. Yeah, and he basically, it was for, for years, essentially, um, that he was on that contract that they had signed. So therefore, he was entitled to all of it. Now, in League of Legends... I don't think it's quite like that. I remember a few years ago, uh, Hooney, who was a, a Korean player that was playing in North America, um, it was quite a, a famous thing that he supposedly was on. A, a, I forget what they called it. Guaranteed contract, I think, was the term people were using. Sure. Where basically it was, he was entitled to all the money of, uh, I don't know, it was like a million or, or maybe even more dollars a year. Um, and I think even one of the details was that he didn't have representation either. He'd done, supposedly negotiated that himself. But as I understand, that's quite uh, the the fact of it being guaranteed. It's quite unusual in League of Legends, and yeah. like you kind of alluded to earlier, if a player get gets benched, likely there's a clause in their contract where they do get reduced salary. So, and also we say about um, maybe even being kick, kicked off a team, they don't want you anymore. As I understand, sure. you could sign a three year contract, but the team could actually just decide they don't want you anymore and, and basically kick you off and, and rip up that contract. So. Maybe that's kind of yeah. a, a couple of questions in there. Maybe first of all, are are there many guaranteed contracts? Um, and if not, do you think there should be? And then maybe the second part is, how can a team give a player a three-year contract and then just rip it up whenever they like? Sure. So the, the guaranteed contract thing, it, it, it's way more common than it was. And that is, again, because of the introduction of agents. Mm-hmm. I think more so than anything, that's the biggest factor in this. Um, what there has been in contracts in League of Legends for years are clauses that say something along the lines of termination without cause. Um, uh, so without reason, effectively. Uh, team X team can terminate contract by giving X amount of notice and paying X salary, like one month salary, two month salary, whatever it may be. Um, and they could just terminate, even if they're six months into a two year deal, three year deal, right? Um, I remove these from contracts now. I, I don't have my players having termination without cause clause in it because it, kind of they don't make any sense, right? When you're signing a contract for X amount of time, you are committing both from both parties mm-hmm. to that period of time. There's never been a clause where where the where the player can just terminate without cause and just yeah. leave a team because he wants to. Um, pretty much, the, the, there's there's clauses all the time where, where I get sent and that the team can just terminate whenever they want. So my, my with my clients, we remove termination without cause clauses, or you get paid a, a significant compensation if they want something like that in there, where mm-hmm. where they're bu- where they're effectively buying you out of your own contract. Um, generally, what happens now, especially at a tier one level, is that you will get a couple of different options. One is, um, one is a, a player has a base salary which they are guaranteed every month, no matter what, through the duration of the contract. And then they have a playing bonus, right? Where if they start the game, they get this much. So often the base salary may be significantly lower than than what their actual salary is a year, but it, it's it's still a decent amount, right? That that they're getting. Maybe, I don't know. Let's talk random numbers. Maybe they get um, 80k a year if base salary. And then playing bonus, so all the all the months that they actually started the games, they get an additional chunk on top of that, which takes it up to realistically what their actual salary is. The event where they they get benched, so to speak, and I don't know, we'll, we'll, they bring in a new top laner and bench the current top laner. The current the, the benched top laner only receives then the base salary, and the the new top laner receives whatever their agreement is Mm -hmm. um but effectively they've removed the playing playing bonus or the 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 playing salary um there is another uh, another one that i see more often at tier two which is is uh where they can't terminate and but players are 
if placed on the substitute bench, you are paid X percentage of your salary, 50%, 40%. Sometimes I've been, I've been saying mm. contracts where it says like 10%, you know? Um, yeah, which, I think that was part uh, of like the reckless G2 drama when he eventually left. <laughs> Uh, and it basically, yeah. well, he yeah. left like a year ago, but it's come out now. Wait, some of the details are coming out where he would have been on. I don't remember the exact number, but it was something silly like ten percent or maybe even less of his yeah, salary which, is what he would have been getting. Uh, but and he didn't have representation at the time and signed that, right? So in my eyes, it's, I think, it's I, somewhat. I, I, fair. I think even it said. I think he was streaming or something. He said he, it was checked like by a, like his lawyer or something, and it yeah, was pointed sure. out to him like this is a dodgy contract. And he was like, oh well, I'm reckless. I'm going to play. Yeah, um, uh, and I fun. think that's I think that's um, something to I guess touch on while we're talking about agents a lot is the difference between a lawyer and an agent, right? Because mm-hmm. uh, a lot of the time, players will in the past have had contracts checked by lawyers, and there's been nothing illegal in the contract. There's been poor terms and stuff that you wouldn't want to agree on. Yeah. But a lawyer is not there to to tell you what is a good and bad term. The lawyer is there to tell you is that legally enforceable or not. Yeah. An agent knows what the industry standard is, and and therefore knows if you're you're getting screwed over by the team not illegally but actually that's just not fair on you to it's not fair on you to to um sign a three-year deal but the team can get review at any point in that three years they want but you can't get out of it in if you want to but that's not illegal that that's uh you've agreed to that so so the, the, there's a quite a big difference and and what uh, and sometimes players I, I guess who have never had an agent perhaps don't understand that sometimes <clears throat> but yeah, Reckless had an awful deal. Reckless thought some of the stuff in that contract would never happen. He would never be benched. He would never be kicked from the team. He would start every game. Uh, and ultimately, that didn't happen, right? And because he signed a deal that was um, so G2 favoured in that particular instance, he ended up in a situation where G2 held all the cards to, for three years of his career. And if they really wanted to, sure, they could have let Reckless, one of the best steady carriers that the, the region has ever seen, probably the world has ever seen over the course of his career, not play League of Legends for the remaining two years, and he could have just been sat on the bench to be paid a, for him a very, very low salary. Right? And we could have we could have lost two years of reckless career to that. Um, obviously, oh, that one didn't of them happen. already was, where he well, didn't get an LEC spot because obviously yeah. they wanted a good buyout because they held the card, so if he was going to go, they could demand a good buyout fee, no team sure. wanted to do it, and he ended up not in the the tier one league uh, and to me there's there's a couple of things about this right what one is is riots transfer system i think there needs to be an overhaul of of the the way they approach and look at the transfer window as a whole i think there's been poaching rules and stuff in the past but <clears throat> to me that g2 reckless situation was a perfect time for a loan opportunity where mm-hmm. um okay reckless d- d- isn't wanted by g2 but he's under contract for three years uh, he's got some issues to fix from their point of view. I mean, maybe it's not amendable in that particular instance, but um, what would have made a lot of sense is that if something like Carmine Corp was able to loan Reckless for six months, 12 months from G2, he could go there and play. Um, they would cover X amount of salary. G2 would continue to cover maybe a, a small part of Reckless' salary. Reckless is still being paid a lot because he's a top player, but you still get to play League of Legends and maybe even all of the con- all of the salary that is agreed is being covered by Carmine Corp and not by G2. Uh, and maybe it, it, for a young player, uh, we see this all the time with young rookies going into tier one. They play for a split, they play for two splits, they, the team realizes when they're not good enough yet, and as a result, kicks them back down to tier two. Well, why not, why not be able to loan that player back down to tier two while they develop and then um, with, a, with an ERL team covering X amount of the salary, and then bring them back once they fixed the the issues, and and, and they're very, the team's very clear about what issues or what what development this player development route this player needs to take. So stuff like loan deals for me it, it, it would be a great addition to the, the transfer window. Do you know why that's? Do you know why they're not allowed? I, I, I remember I, back in the day, I remember Double Lift going on loan from because I remember he was playing for TSM. <laughs> this I don't know how many years ago this was now. He was playing for TSM and had t- taken a split off, so he was still contracted to, to TSM, <laughs> and it was Team Liquid that was like obviously one of the, the biggest orgs in yeah. esports full stop and especially in North American uh, League of Legends they're massive and they've ended up winning tar- loads of titles now but at the time they had been kind of struggling to to kind of reach the top level and then they had one split where they were it was just a disaster and they were basically going to get relegated or very likely and TSM loaned Doublelift to, to Team Liquid 
uh, as a like a regular, like you would in football, you uh, loan it, maybe the play half yeah. the salary. Whatnot. I don't know the reason. To, I, I, my, my assumptions would be that they don't want anything that could be considered not match fixing, you know, but but um, X team wants this team to progress in playoffs and they loan a player to them, you know, or mm -hmm. uh, okay, strengthening it. Just... Not a allowing... team that's in their league, you know, yeah, not allowing was... within the same league or something say, of that nature. Maybe sure. just not, yeah, not tier even tier one to tier one because you could potentially go against them in in world, you know, in worlds if you loan a player to North America and then yeah. Or I mean, you could, yeah, I I guess within football you, you you kind of counter that with like stuff like cup tied, right? Like where they can't yeah. play against uh, then their mother team or um via a cup tied rule that if we loan this player to them you can't then play against your your own team so they would have to have another player and i guess that can then cause complications it's not like teams have squads of players where they've got multiple 80 carries or whatever so if it was their only 80 carry and then they got drawn up against their own team and you couldn't play what do they do you know um but for me, it's something that can be worked out better. I think it can be mm -hmm. beneficial to players for longevity of their careers. That that loans are a, a thing for sure. I suppose There's maybe then that would just jump up. I guess it would go, be um, maybe in, maybe it'd be worse for ERL teams. So the, the the tier two teams who, in the current system, if there is a good young player that no one in the in tier one wants, you are going to sign them. And then if some if someone in tier one does want them after they've played well in your team you've got a chance of getting a buyout from a tier one team and, and for a tier two, which is largely semi-pro or even amateur teams, um, mm. that could be a decent paycheck. And I guess if you're only loaning players and then tier one teams could effectively just hoard all the all the good up and coming players and then just loan them out. And I mean, they could, but they'd have to still pay salaries, right? Unless yeah. they found a loan deal. Um, but I mean, maybe, maybe uh, it would. I think you would have more multi-man rosters in tier one for sure mm -hmm. uh you would you wouldn't just have the five players you'd have five players plus maybe a load e in each each position or something but there's enough players you know that there's always enough players coming through um generally to to fill slots in teams uh, and these players would still be playing it's not like they wouldn't be playing but uh, i mean realistically all the money is in the top 10 teams of each major region you know so um that money to trickle down, that money to to go to go to teams is, I mean, and to players is is good for the player's career for sure. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I mean, maybe maybe right. I've got a different reason than than something I thought yeah. of. But um, I, I personally feel that loans would be good all round if they were managed correctly. Mm -hmm. um, just to touch it, one more question on the um, when we're talking about like the the, the contracts, contracts being being terminated and things. What would then, what is the benefit of a player signing a three-year contract? Why would you ever opt into that then when you know it could be cancelled at any time on the team's end? But then also if you want to leave, you then can't necessarily do that if the team doesn't want you to leave. So what yeah. is the actual benefit? You, you shouldn't, is, is the truth. If, if you've got a termination clause that is terminate without cause by the team, of course you shouldn't opt into a, a deal because it's not a three-year deal. It's a however long the team wants you for a deal. Mm -hmm. And that's not what it should be. If it's a three-year deal, it's a three-year deal from both sides, in my opinion. There can be termination with cause. For instance, if you breach your contract, if you uh, are seen to, to uh, I don't know, uh, discriminatory or match fixing or betting yeah, on yeah. games that you come about, of course, all these things are, are termination with cause and, and absolutely fine, justified. But to, to not be justified in the termination of someone's job um when you have told them you will commit to them for x amount of time to me is is just not fair in any way but i think teams have been used to having that luxury and perhaps they're not so much sometimes now and and that doesn't stand well with some people but um the, the truth is that should have always been the way mm -hmm. and uh, but i would like to see players on longer term deals and i would like to see all players bought and sold as opposed to Every year we get a turnaround where all players go for free. Uh, well, I mean, not all players, but a lot of players, especially at Tier 2, become free agents in November and they're free pickings. And what we're getting is that a team has committed X amount of salary uh, to a player for, for one year, right? Which may be a quite a significant amount if they're trying to win like EU Masters. If they're of a level of team, they've spent quite a lot of money on that player of the year. Then the player goes to LEC for free. Or, or because he, he developed really well, he worked really hard this year, became really good. 
all of a sudden his contract runs out in November, the teams let the contract run down mm-hmm. and player is is now a free agent. When there's no reason why these the, the LEC teams can't pay for the player, right? They're, they've got plenty of money to to pay a ERL buyout to, to sign that player, but they don't have to because of the way their contract was handled by um by by the team. And if you watch something like football nowadays in football, it, it's really we're going to sell the player uh, actively in the transfer window prior to their contract running out, and mm-hmm. we're going to look for a buying team, even if it's at cut price. We're, we're recouping some of the money. That we've invested in this player because he won't re-sign with us. If he will re-sign, they re-sign in the previous transfer window um, to ensure that there's an extension. And if this player wants to then go, people in in esports, um, I, I remember inspired re-signing with Rogue and for like two more years, and then he went to EG. Yeah, like a month right? later. And, and pe- but people for 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 like fans and stuff assume that because you re-sign, that means you're with. Rogue for two I'm years. I'm also but, the way they announced it these, right. when this happens. They always go, he, you know, he's with us for two more years, kind of thing. Sure, yeah, sure. And I mean, maybe that plays a big part in it. But re-signing a contract does not mean that, that a player is is on that team for two years. That means that if another opportunity presents itself that the player wants and and the and therefore the the team is happy with, um, that the fee that is going to be hit, then. Then everyone's getting a good deal, right? The new the new buying team is happy to pay that money to, to get this new player. The player is getting a, a a big transfer to perhaps a bigger club or a bigger opportunity, uh, and um, the the selling club has just been given a load of cash that they can then go on spend on a replacement, right? Uh, and something like the Inspired deal, where he obviously signed two more year two more years, him having a two years left on his contract makes it more valuable than than obviously mm-hmm. having one month left or two months left on his contract. Yeah. I suppose that is an example. It was a, a win all round because Rogue got their buyout fee. They replaced him with uh, Rang, I'm blanking the guy's name now, the Korean jungler. But they ended Mal up Rang. Mal Rang, yeah. and they ended up winning the league. And then Inspired went to Evil Geniuses in North America and won the league there as well. So literally everyone yeah, so won the title. It, it, it looks like a it looks like a win win all round in that sense. Yeah. But people don't see it as such um, from a from a public perception when they when they see that kind of deal. They don't quite understand the economics of. Mm-hmm. I mean, the point of resigning is really to to ensure that if he goes, if such a talent goes, and you've invested money into him, you want to recoup that and replace him with someone who you think is equally skilled or more skilled or, or whatever it may be to to try and improve and build on your roster, not just lose money every year for spending player salaries and then not getting anything out of it other than paying month by month for the player to play for you. Mm-hmm. Well, what kind of a what kind of buyout <coughs> fee is is normal if we're actually talking numbers then? Because you can. Conf- Compared to football, where obviously we know that football's you know outrageous with transfer, especially after the the uh, infamous Neymar one to PSG a few years ago, where it basically it more than doubled the previous record to mm-hmm. like two hundred million pounds, and it's not no one no other transfer has come close to it since, and probably won't maybe even ever uh, to be honest. Yeah, um, sure. But even before that, football tra- football fees were were way um, kind of overinflated. So what's a normal fee in in let's say League of Legends then? Because I feel like this this kind of concept of a transfer fee is still fairly novel and maybe isn't well like you said it doesn't happen maybe as much as you think it should yeah so there's not uh, and maybe... even when it does it's like really kept under wraps as yeah. like some kind of like hidden secret that this player was pay, was bought for this much mm-hmm. i guess within our own native region of the nlc um someone like uh x7 sold both aru and chasey to lec teams um in this most recent last year and um, on those, I understand that they 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 something like I, I think it was something like four hundred and fifty percent in terms of like an invest a return of investment right on on those two players in terms of what they spent on salary compared to what they they returned in in um, in transfer fees for mm-hmm. for these players to move. So okay, they can be criticised for spending a lot of money on these players monthly, but. I mean, it was a way better investment than a cheap player that would have gone for free at the end of the season because mm-hmm. they four and a half times the amount of money they spent. Um, so uh, I think a lot of the transfers we see in Europe are mostly kind of um, uh, good ERL players to to LEC teams and dependent on the contract and again so we're talking about termination clauses of contracts before the buyouts are are also something very similar to that there's there's a lot of buyout clauses that are 
uh, buyout to be determined by um, the selling team upon interest, basically. So I'm interested in buying X player from ERL team. ERL teams can decide any number that they want, right? They'll often they'll often express that X team has reached out to to them. LEC team has reached out to us. They want to buy you. And then the player says, well, I really want to go. Uh, and then the, the team go, okay, well, we're going to ask for X amount for you. That is uh, a thing. Mm-hmm. And I, I guess that number varies anywhere from... It's, it's really hard to tell the, the variation. Uh, I guess someone like Haru or something is more like 150K or, or, or something for, for uh, any... Uh, uh, and the, again, the, the, I was not privy to these deals, so this is really kind of speculation. But rough numbers, you're talking about 150,000 euros or something like that uh, as a as a fee to buy a, a player like that. Um, ERL, ERL buyouts, I guess, are probably between kind of 30 to 80 on average, probably. Um, uh, if you're talking about a, a fairly good ERL players, uh, I mean, maybe up to 100k. It varies a bit, but these are not fees that teams won't pay at an LEC or or LCS level that they'll pay this as a as a buyout. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's the sums of money that are worth are worth being a selling club for, effectively, and are worth not letting your players um, always become free agents for, mm-hmm. uh, and forcefully uh, chasing those those little pots of gold that you get from selling players. Um, but but yeah, I, I mean, and then if you're talking LEC to, or, I mean, if you if you're talking some of the the, the kind of top Korean talent coming to, the the, the top kind of potential Korean talent, mm-hmm. so we're seeing players um, come across from kind of LCK Challenger to LCS and LCK Challenger to to Europe and stuff. Um, I've seen seen Korean teams ask for 350k, 450k even for for some of their top LCK Korean um korean kind of talent coming through um so i I mean there's no real limit on on what that can be what there is is like say that there's a lot of clauses in which the the selling team determines it when i have potential players who who i think can make the lec or make lcs make uh tier one league of legends from a tier two league of legends team and i sign a deal for them to join their their tier two, so I've signed some players into the LVP this this year. Players like Obstinatus at Rebels. Uh, I signed Keo to Solari last year in the LFL. Uh, I signed someone like Mart to UCAM. Some some upcoming players who I think have got bright futures in front of them. Um, I always aim to get a set buyout that I think is fair for both team and player. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's a, a it's a buyout that that a team in the LEC, if they're serious about their interests, will meet and is is of the value. And it's also a, a, a fair fee for the selling team to to actually recoup for, because I know the amount they're invested in my player. So um, I, I try to get a set fee in, in which is matchable for teams to, to buy players. I also did a deal for um, Peach to join. Uh, the, he's an upcoming Korean jungler who was at DRX uh, Challengers or DRX Academy. Um, last year, he's joined Unicorns of Love. So, uh, and he is um, a player that I, I'm. I, I feel very strongly can, can compete at an LEC level. Um, he's going to come over a bit like I guess Haru did, Chasey did at X7, mm-hmm. um, compete in the ERLs, show what he can do. And then I, I'm very confident that LEC teams, LCS teams would be interested in him after they see him play for a bit. So all being well, that there's a, there's a buyout there in which I, is a fair buyout. Uh, it would be good for you well to get that buyout. It would be good for, um, it would be good for Peach to get the move, and it doesn't stop him getting a move. He's not going to get priced out of a move to an LEC or an LCS team. Um, it, it, it's not like we can all of a sudden just say well, on these on these selling club uh, negotiate the buyout kind of clauses. You often find that I mean, a team doesn't want to lose their best player, so they say five hundred grand or a million, uh, and they they can mm-hmm. just say these numbers. And if a team doesn't meet it, they can't go. The player can't go. Yeah, because I remember right? that as much as they want to. When we're talking about like the the reckless leaving G two that roster he was on kind of 
well, G2 wanted to explode it basically because they for G2 it was a, a terrible sure. year. It was him, Wonder, and Mickey X that G2 was trying to get rid of all of them. And I remember the rumors coming out of like, oh, this is what the buyouts are for each player. And then a f- few weeks later, no one had taken it yet, so the buyouts lowered. It was almost like I don't know if you've watched the the game show Pointless, where you have to mm-hmm. like. Someone yeah, has to you guess. A, it's just like a question. You have to guess an answer that nobody would give, that and it basically a bar have. starts at a hundred, and it goes, do, 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 and it will yeah. stop when it reaches your thing. And I feel like G two was doing that. Like this is the buyout, and then do, 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 do. someone offered yeah. it here. Right. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think I think that was a bit of a case. So the G two, I think it was a bit of a case of timing. So like we said earlier, a lot of pre agreements are already made in advance. So mm-hmm. I think a lot of the teams that they could have gone to already had pre agreements with different players, uh, and therefore. Um, that they could just take these players, uh, but uh, partly they didn't know they were going to be sellable until like November or something, and um, uh, and as a result, there was already deals in place for the other teams that would have potentially bought these players. Uh, maybe the bouts were too high. Maybe the bouts were not, not kind of. I, I don't know how clearly they were they were spoken to with other teams mm-hmm. or to the players themselves. Again, that was a situation where where G2 held all the cards, right? They they could make up whatever number they wanted to if, if they wanted to. Obviously, it's not in their interest to price these players out of moves because they wanted the players to move. So it's in their interest to sell the players. In the end, I think G2 probably accepted something significantly lower for Reckless than, than anyone could have imagined and mm-hmm. was very happy that to get Reckless off their, off their payroll, but also Reckless was probably very happy to get a team that he could actually play for and, and compete on. So, um, But yeah, I, I mean... I, I, my view is it's not good for teams to hold all the cards in in the the careers of of those who they work with, but it should be fair for the teams. Um, mm-hmm. And that, that's my aim always when I'm doing these deals is that is that my players have got a very fair chance to progress. Should they perform? Should they attract the interest of top teams? there's a price on their head in which the top team will more than willingly pay, but it also uh, compensates the, the team that they're leaving for the, the putting the trust in that player that, that has then learned that opportunity to go to a bigger team. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. <clears throat> um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about salaries then, because um, we hear more and more recently, I feel about how maybe salaries are inflated um, about how teams basically spend like a huge portion of their revenue directly straight into salaries. Um, and you hear how a lot of this money that, that teams spend on salaries has come from, especially at like a tier one level, has come from investor money where a few years ago there was kind of a uh, a scramble basically for invest- investors to put money in esports because it was this new booming industry. Uh, loads of money got thrown at loads of teams. They basically, for lack of a better term, they spaffed a lot of it on really high salaries it seems like and our teams don't really have much money and there's this thought that maybe salaries are going to start dipping a bit now because the money's just not there um maybe what are your just thoughts on on salaries in general um, and how do you see them changing i mean salaries are what teams are willing to pay right ultimately the, your employers can pay a certain amount they've got a certain amount of money and what they're willing to pay is where salaries are if top players in the region are starting to be paid a huge amount that makes their their value is that and therefore yeah. Uh, the the that raises the if Neymar's move is two hundred million, an average player is now worth hundred and hundred million. Yeah, new precedent, you know? basically. Yeah. When it sets that bar higher and higher, and and of course that's not particularly healthy for for the ecosystem. It, it's great for the player that received that money, of course, but that's one player, and now it's going to dip for everyone else. So it, it's not great overall. Um, what I believe is that that teams have been very poor in they spend the most on players out of anything that they spend basically but they've been very poor at recouping or uh utilizing the fact that a player is is worth this much and um we've spoken to some examples where teams have sold players and made money we've spoken to some examples where they've actually made money on 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 transfers and i think this has to happen way more i think all players should be bought and sold and and therefore um this allows you to spend a lot on a player, knowing that his value is this much and you can make this much. So, I mean, if you spend over the odds for a player monthly, but you recoup all of that at the end of the year and enough to replace him, it doesn't actually matter that you spent that much money. What matters is that when you invest that much money monthly into into a talented player, 
that talented player then goes for free, right? And <laughs> and you just paid X amount for him to play for you. You're, you're paying month by month, and, it, and the only money you're recouping from that is whatever results you got and what those results bring, whether that's new commercial deals or whether it's the prize mm-hmm. money, whatever it may be. Um, so navigation of the transfer market is super important for teams to be more sustainable than they are. And this is more applicable to the teams that have less investment, right? The, the tier two teams that are trying their best to push for EU Masters, trying to push for winning EU Masters, trying to push best to push regional leagues. And they're utilizing talented upcoming players to do that, but then they're not getting anything for the talented upcoming player at the end of the year and that they really need to. And even amongst themselves, they need to work in a way in which is going to buy and sell players to each other um, to, to generate a source of a source of revenue effectively a source of income is from is from player sales so um salaries are i mean they vary a lot right that they vary quite dramatically but there's there is and has always been such a humongous gap between tier two and tier one mm-hmm. it, it's not like uh so there's a humongous gap between the championship and premiership in, in salaries in in football right but it's just it's that tenfold, you know. You're looking at you're looking at good ER, top ERL players that are contested for you masters being paid kind of three, four, five grand a month, and then you 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 jump in you jump into twenty, twenty five grand a month for for average LEC players, mm-hmm. you know. And there's a huge difference. Um, you're talking fivefold at least. Um, in terms of your salary, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I, don't know, I think, I think, like I say, that the, where the precedence is, or where the precedence is, is in terms of the top end salaries, what's being paid, um, and, and I guess this is where teams like to keep uh, what they're paying players fairly under wraps, so that mm-hmm. the precedence doesn't affect the tr- future transfers, and it doesn't affect, but players talk to each other, right, and and they do, uh, and players say. I'm on this much and why are you on that much when I'm on this much and I'm a better player and so on in, in mm-hmm. their head, you know? Um, so, so this happens, but uh, I think that's the, the incentive for teams to keep salaries under wraps is that it doesn't determine what they need to pay future players and such um, as much as in football where you, you publicly find any, any player yeah. uh, what, what he's been paid. Fair enough. Um, Maybe last question on contracts then. We've talked about a fair bit, actually maybe a couple of questions, um, around clauses. So we talked about termination clauses and um, buyout clauses and, and whatnot. What's maybe the worst clause you've seen someone try and sneak in? So you've, you sign a player to a team, they send over the contract. What's like the most dodgy thing you've seen and tried to slip in there, see if you don't notice? Um... Uh, uh, I'm not sure. I, there's, I think a lot of them are the termination clauses because they're the most detrimental to the players, uh, and they they try to make it not obvious. Sometimes they try to say like, if the player performs slightly below our standards, it is a potential for termination or something. So it's like with cause, but the cause is like Very so ambiguous, ambiguous yeah. that it could be anything. Like what is what is performing below standard? You know, like. That they could they just set their own standard on that day and the standard was below that so sorry you're fired you know and um that's not a contract is not about ambiguity a contract is about clear and precise and, mm-hmm. and clarity over your uh, over whatever you're committing to uh, and I, i've seen lots of co- lots of clauses like that very common which is sad right but uh, yeah like i say like i mean maybe you lost your matchup that you're meant to lose and you're meant to be down 10 cs uh, over the course of the laning phase and you're down 15 and like well you perform below standard like mm-hmm. not that, not that people have been sacked off this but but there's potential for that you yeah. know there's potential for termination off of off of useless useless information and, mm-hmm. and silly things like that of ambiguity i'm sure if i put a bit more thought to it that there's probably some more completely outrageous and silly ones but yeah um those type of ones are the ones that are potentially most detrimental to contracts is mm-hmm. when you could just rip the contract up because of some standard that's set on the day yeah were there any clauses that 
that players have that maybe just fans would be perhaps surprised here. So, for example, in football, uh, if you sign a striker to your team, they might have a goal scoring bonus. So every time the player scores a goal, they get a bit of extra money. So is a is reckless getting a, a bonus for a pentakill or anything like that? Um, that's obviously a. The, there's there's awful, definitely but... there's definitely MVP uh, and like rookie of the split bonuses in certain contracts. Um, I, I've I've actually signed contracts this year in in ERLs where uh, a player, some players that are coming in as rookies to um, certain big ERLs in, in LVP and stuff. I've got rookie of the split bonuses in. They get rookie of the split by the awarded by the league. They get they get a bonus amount of money. Um, or MVP of the split, even more. Uh, general bonuses are, are, are more like um, just where they finish in the league, whether the team makes playoffs, whether they make worlds, so on and so forth. But yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, I I don't think they're they're so outlandish or out there. But yeah, mm-hmm. rookie of the split bonuses, I guess, are, are ones that are quite interesting and why it actually means something to some people. Um, yeah. I, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I've signed causes before. I guess a fairly well president of one in Crusher at Fnatic now, who's going to be the head coach of Fnatic. So I've worked on causes before in contracts where people didn't know this for the whole year, but he was effectively set to be, um, should should they want him, it, there was a clause in which the idea was that he would become Fnatic's head coach right from when he signed his academy deal. So we, we signed an academy deal where he was going to become the academy head coach at the start of uh, 2022. And he worked as the academy coach throughout 2022 with the vision that, that the current Fnatic head coach, Yamato Cannon's contract, would end at the end of 2022. And, and there would be a vacant spot in the main team in which the idea was to promote Crusher. So like a promotion clause mm-hmm. is also something I've worked on before. Um, so you're signing a multi-year deal with a view to promote a, a player or a coach from from an academy to a, so, to a main team. Yeah, I was going to say, because yeah, obviously a lot of tier one teams would have an academy team in the ERL, so it's quite common to have that same sort of thing as a the player then if they get bumped up to the LEC. They, they get yeah, I team. think it's always really hard to enforce or ensure that it's enforced because you never know what's going to happen over the course of the year. The, the coach may be worse or the player may be worse than they expected mm-hmm. or may perform worse or whatever, and they, they can't really guarantee that they're going to promote, but you, you, can, you can try and solidify that best you can. And I think in the case that we worked on it in it was solidified best we could um, to ensure that there was promotion in that contract, yeah. Cool. Right then, so let's say then, kind of at, at the point, I guess, where we are now at the time of recording, so we're kind of heading into the middle of January now. Uh, the, the rosters, I don't think there's any roster moves still happening, as far as I know. I'm pretty sure everything should be done by now. Yeah, I think there are some some of the new kind of Arabian League and stuff oh, that right, yeah. they're entering the, the ERLs that they were fairly late to enter in terms of their mm-hmm. knowledge and they're still building some things. But for the most part, yeah, everything's pretty much done and signed, yeah. So at this point then, you've, you know, your players are signed, uh, you've, the contracts are done. What do you do now then? Do you sit around for six months until... <laughs> they feel the the next off season for MSI and, and yeah, what, I mean, what is if the only <laughs> off season. Um, sure. So, I guess a big part is ensuring my clients are happy. That they're all bedding in with the new teams. Um, they are. I need to check everything that, that, that their careers are running smoothly. Right. That it's not just a. I'm going to take your money each month and not sit here and do anything. I'm going to go out and visit various clients. I'm likely to go to see heretics and, and go visit. Go visit Evie um, over in Berlin. Um, as of the end of last year, I went to Worlds in New York and and uh, and got close to some of the teams there. I had meetings with um, with uh, DRX specifically about their academy players, which we then went on to represent most of. Um, so I, I guess a lot of it is networking and scouting uh, for the most part, as well as maintaining and building on relationships with our current clients to ensure that they're happy that, that everything is running smoothly amongst um, amongst what they're doing and they can focus on playing the game and I can I can ensure everything outside of the game is taken care of for them. Mm-hmm. If they're unhappy with something amongst the team, if they're unhappy with something that the org promised but isn't fulfilling the promise, it's my job to, to support our players in finding a resolution for that. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, ultimately, I'm going to, as the ERL starts, as the LEZ starts, as the LCS starts, it's my job to find and and attract talent to join us that i can then help further their careers cool um 
maybe one thing I just want to ask then on that the thing you mentioned about DRX. So you said earlier how about uh, how about you got um, I don't know if you said you were a part of it actually then, but basically about one of the DRX players uh, joining. I think you said Unicorns of Love. I forget the guy's name, yeah. but you just said peach, that. Yeah. Um, you said then about meeting the team and then ended up uh, representing some of the players. Because so I'd heard about this before, where there there can be situations where teams themselves like represent the players, which is obviously a massive yeah. conflict of interest. So how does that something, what is, for example, in that case with DRX, how does that work then that DRX so, are the ones looking for it? Could there be a, argue that there's a conflict there? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, uh, if, if they were actively hiring me, which they weren't, right, it's the players that actively choose in the end to sign with me or not. Um, but teams... I mean, lots of teams and managers and do care about the players they're working with that they've worked with for the last year, with the, worked with the last couple of years, and they know that these players are ending their contracts. They know that a player has interest from elsewhere and would like to move if if they get that opportunity because maybe they're in an academy, like in DRX instance, but they're going to get to play a, a starting team somewhere else. Um, so. Yes, so we had a connection with with DRX, our, our Korean agent. I was in New York for Worlds. They were in New York for Worlds. Um, we talked to them uh, quite extensively in, in a range of meeting where I met with their managing director or their assistant managing director uh, about uh, their plans for the off season, their plans for for what they were going to do with their rosters. Um, they they've got some very very talented. They're one of the best uh, academies in Korea, um, where they're bringing through really promising players. I, I I looked at these players. I spoke to our Korean agent about these players. It was of both our interest that we would potentially work with these players. We then spoke to the players. Players, with certain players for that team were interested in working with us for find potential suitable teams in Europe or America that may be interested in these players um, to move abroad. So it wasn't a conflict of interest in terms of like the team wasn't the agent or the team didn't sign the agency to to look after its players. The team suggested to its players that we think this is a good agency that mm -hmm. would help support your next steps, and uh, ultimately that's what we did. Um, and we, we continue to and, and have worked with a few of the DRX guys. And like you say, for instance, uh, Peach, uh, the new jungler of Unicorns of Love in in the Prime League, um, was a DRX academy player. Is now coming over to to compete in in the Prime League. I'm sure will be, in my opinion top junglers in ERLs over the course of um, th this upcoming this upcoming year. Uh, and for me, very, very likely to then go on to LEC, LCS, uh, where, wherever it may be. After having a period of time, perhaps learning better English, perhaps settling into the culture um, uh, and everything that comes with moving continent. But um, yeah, we just married together the, the, the teams that, and uh, like, I mean, it, it's what benefits everyone, right? It, it benefits the players that, that they want these moves abroad. They want to, to build the network. A bit like every wants to build his, his connection to, to Europe, wants to build his, his um, uh, understand the landscape of a new region and what better to do that when someone who, who actively works in that region and, mm -hmm. and represents players in that area. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, for us, it, it really a no-brainer when players are that talented, as long as they've got the right kind of mental attributes that they really are, are, are driven and want to succeed um, and have a, a good mindset about them that, that we would want to work with them to try and further their careers and help them reach the top effectively. Cool. Um, maybe one uh, kind of side topic there then is uh, is Korean players and, and specifically agency in Korea because I know there was fairly recently, I think it's a few months ago now, um, an announcement from the LCK, which is the, the Korean League of Legends uh, League, uh, the Tier 1 division there. Uh, and there's basically this announcement that there's going to be like a agency certification there, which is going to be certified, I think it was by KESPA, which is sort of like a governing body of esports in Korea. Mm. Um, and there's kind of been some controversy around that, uh, around the change, kind of part of it being that uh, it's kind of in in partnership with Kespar and by extension was in with partnership with Riot who's the developer of the game so you kind of to be an agent you have to be in a kind of a, with a few a couple of steps removed you basically have to be uh, accepted by Riot as the developer and then there's maybe a bit of a conflict there that the agent isn't always necessarily going to be in 
the player's best interest because they still have to be nice. To, well, they still have to be doing stuff that the developer is happy with and that Kesper is happy with, uh, which maybe doesn't always represent the player's best interest. So, um, sure. is that? Do you know much about those changes and maybe what your I, general I, thoughts? I don't. No, I, I don't know too much. I, I think I, I don't disagree with regulation as as it is in in other things because what needs to stop is a bit like all other roles people just say putting their hands up and saying i'm an agent now you know or or, uh i represent this player like Mm -hmm. that should not be able to just be said and not suffer consequences if it's not factual you know um in esports we've always had a problem with i'm a coach now i'm a manager now this is an org now um the only ones you can't really bypass that are players because they have to play the game right but but people can kind of say they're a role and it just needs to be accepted as such so i i don't i don't necessarily disagree that actually you have to prove your credentials to to mm-hmm. fulfill a role uh especially a role where you you've got a duty of care to to others uh, i'm not sure exactly what um what these regulations w- will be i mean like i said we've got a career a career agent that, that's kind of on the ground there that, that probably knows better than i do exactly what they're requiring but um like i said i don't think there's there's no qualms from from actual agencies uh, about being certified that you're an agency and being proven to be such um and proven that you would support players best interests because uh, I mean, imposters in in all roles are, are just not good for the mm-hmm. space, of course. Yeah, actually, to be fair, I was um so I was listening to an episode of the Four Horsemen, uh, a different podcast, and uh, Monte Cristo, who is a former LCK caster, um, I think he casted Overwatch and some Counter Strike as well. Uh, but basically, he's well connected to uh, the Korean league, and he was kind of saying that it was almost in a way that they would, because supposedly these certifications are only going to be in Korean, you can't take an English test uh, or a test in English, as I say, for that. Uh, and part of the idea was maybe to, as part of it being to try and keep the Korean players in Korea, basically, because you're going to get them on Korean agents who are certified by this Korean governing body. So the Korean agents, it's also in their interest to keep them in Korea. But then I guess for you guys, where you've, you know, it's a big company where you've got a Korean agent, but then you've also got other agents that can represent the same player. Yeah, uh, that's sure. Got, sort of a good way around it then. We can, we can pass players throughout for, as long as it's for the player's best interest throughout the agency right so caa stella we've got a korean office with korean agents that work in i mean all things korea basically um football and and, and the, the film side and that actors actresses um but we've got a korean league of legends agent that that does that so if america wants to move to europe obviously then that goes through me to represent that player in those regions uh, and bring that player over oh my god have i gone again or is that uh, it's, just your... it didn't fully go that time oh, uh, i think it's going back how strange um sure i mean i apologize about these <laughs> these network issues apparently but um yeah I, I mean we have that covered in that sense that that we can we can best um globally represent clients right and not just um locally mm-hmm. fair enough um that kind of brings me to the end of the main topics I had. The rest is kind of just random questions then, I suppose. Sure. Um, so I've just got a few, maybe just a uh, lighthearted ones to end off. Actually, maybe this isn't that lighthearted. What's the kind <laughs> of, what's maybe some dirty tricks you've heard of people trying? Because one thing I'd seen, it might have even been on that same Four Horsemen podcast, or it might have been on Twitter, but uh, Rich, who is a former owner of H2K, who is also an agent, I forget which company yes. he works for, I, suppose Black rival, Lodge, I, think is, yeah. I guess a rival, a rival of yours but he'd um i saw him say i think it was on twitter that there had been oh no it might be one of the leakers saying actually i can't remember exactly who um but someone saying that they'd ha- had accounts of people basically going to teams and saying they're the agent for a certain player when they're actually not and then they might do it basically the hope is that they could agree a deal for the player and then go to the player and say look i've got you this move if you agree to if come and sign for my agency, exactly. Yeah, so that I mean, that's that's the dirty, dirty tricks uh, of the game, really. That that stuff shouldn't happen, and, and that's where certification is good because you should not be able to actively talk about a t- about a player if you are not legally representing that player. It should mm-hmm. be it should not. It, it, you you cannot enter into a negotiation for a 
for a client that's not your client. Um, it happens. Uh, whether it should happen or not, I, I don't know. I, you shouldn't be able to claim that you're representing a player. I think, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't know about dirty tricks, really. I, I guess manipulating you don't the media. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. Uh, well, maybe that, yeah. Uh, manipulating the media to to leverage um, leverage your players um, or, or anything of that nature. Uh, but yeah, go into go into teams and say, look, I'm this player's agent. Um, whatever uh, it is yeah for me it's it's a no-no let me go to the next okay. one then yeah go <laughs> uh, so another player well i guess player maybe i think is coaching now uh on your roster uh is mm. the infamous dardock um obviously f- famous from his uh especially from his team liquid days uh mm. and that old documentary um but then the, the the kind of thing was that everyone always said was that actually if he ever came to europe maybe his um his personality might fit better in Europe where it's kind of a, you've got this impression where in North America players sometimes don't want to argue with each other. don't want to hear uh, any criticism, but in Europe players are more open to, to basically being angry at each other to the point of being able to yeah. actually build off of that and, and make progress. So people actually said, well, if Darlock came to Europe, uh, he would maybe work better there. Uh, and I remember when you uh, signed him to represent him, I think you came on an old podcast of mine and we kind of asked you about that. If, if he would come to Europe. And I think at the time then he said that he was open to it. Um, but I think he's ended up doing sort of coaching roles uh, since then. Yeah. Yeah. Is there ever uh, a chance we'll, we'll see EU, EU West Dardock though? Or I guess EIA um, now. But yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, he's, he's for clarity, he's no longer a client of ours and only oh, right, to the okay. purpose that he actually decided to just pursue what he was pursuing rather than, I guess, new opportunities now. Um, he may, I mean, it's a possibility for sure. I think he was very open to it in the time we were working together. Um, it didn't work out for, for a few reasons, really. I mean, there was teams potentially interested. They chose to go down different routes and such. But um, I, I don't know for sure that if he came to Europe, it would have been like, this is much better. I, I think the culture would fit his approach significantly more. In, in Historically, in, in NA, there's a lot of um, you're being too negative, uh, you're killing a G or mm-hmm. um, through through criticism, uh, which which I mean, I think it can be taken down down to the way it's said more often than than what's being said. Cause what what's being said when when criticism comes out quite often is it's quite true, but uh, it's the way it's being said non-constructively, I guess, in which people gets people's backs up. Um, but there's for sure been a, a two different cultures that have been running side by side where one is it's got a team to work. The the other is uh, we are going to call out uh, um, issues. We're going to call out issues very openly amongst the group to, to resolve them as quickly as possible. And I, I think the latter works better than the former. But um, th- th- there's a way to do it. And that has to be that has to be regulated by by good coaching, by good staffing, by mm-hmm. good um mediators in the middle i suppose fair enough uh maybe last question then um who would you say is maybe the the jorge mendez or, or the mini rowler uh, of esports <laughs> of league of legends for anyone who doesn't know who they are they are i think mini rowler i think he's one actually sadly passed away recently but they, yeah, those two pa- were like the big they call them super agents in football that basically broker the top top hundreds of millions of pound deals and they make tens of millions off of these yeah. transfers, uh, and they're kind of vilified, I guess. Um, yeah, in, in yeah, football. I but think so. Do you see? Do you see anyone kind of fulfilling that? Uh, yeah, that kind of villain role as a super agent in League of Legends anytime soon? Yeah. So, who's the who's the the kind of super agent of the the esports world? Um, I don't know if there's been one created yet. Really, you know, I think. Uh, someone, uh, a company like Surge, there's a guy, Oliver, who, who I think is in charge of Surge. He, uh, I guess, got in there earlier and has got a lot of the big the big names, I suppose, the, the Bjergsons, the Double Lifts. I think he even signed Reckless after the whole G2 thing. So he's he's signed a lot of the big players uh, and and therefore I assume done a lot of the big deals. Um, but to, to what, to what, 
level of impact he had on those deals and such is is really hard to 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 know without more information being public. Um, I, I guess there's room for for these characters to to be built if more knowledge about the the insides of what goes on in transfers is is public and and. Um, I guess in East, in football and such, the reason they're vilified is because that they seem to be taking money from beloved teams, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and um, because teams have got fans, but but agents obviously don't really have fans. Um, I, I think what, what I'd like to see is is certain agents be be recognised as uh, the the people that are getting the best deals for their players that are getting. If you're with that agency, you're going you're going far. You're going mm-hmm. to big teams. You're getting good salary. You're getting more salary than if you weren't with that agency. Um, and that's what I'd like to be recognised for is is that my players are, are getting better deals than they would if they were with counterparts or or not with an agency at all. Um, and I, I truly believe that that's what happens in lots of our cases is that. Is that our players are, are better off with us, even when we take out our cut, um, than they would be without us, right? And, and that's that's the point of it. We want them to to be really successful, and that, that's the aim of what I do. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's room for these these characters to, uh, I guess, yeah, be be portrayed more as as villains or or heroes of players' careers, whatever way you want to put it. Um, should more knowledge about the insides of what goes on in the in the transfer market come about, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. We'll see if it happens then. Um, well, I'm I'm all out of questions then. To be fair, is there anything anything else you wanted to cover? Anything you think we should know about agents that maybe we don't? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I, I think we've covered a lot. I think um, you'll see a lot of CAA Stella uh, now. Now it was formerly ICM Stella and and CAA Stella now because CAA bought ICM. ICM was like the fifth biggest agency in the world, I think, and CAA was number one. So the, the encapsulation of both it makes CAA a so huge now they're number six. entity. <laughs> now, now they're, they're they're way up way up the the kind of the top echelons of best agencies in the world, um, and they they probably have a different view on on perhaps some of my work and and how we should push for for this year further. So I think you'll see a lot from our agency, particularly this year. Um, in, in kind of stepping up that that hunt to be a, a super agent, I suppose, if we want to call it that, um, of especially the League of Legends world. But we, we've got agents in Valorant, CSGO, Fortnite, Rocket League, various other esports titles. So I want to make our agency an agency where, where players want to come to, right? This is the place they want to be. Um, and that's what we're working on. So, yeah, I, I mean, any questions, any, anything like that that anyone has in the future, look, look, post them on our comments, post them for, for stuff that we could talk about on future episodes and, and we can always touch on this kind of thing. But um, my my view is that with this podcast, we continue to to address various topics that people want more insight into um, and and we continue to have, while, while there'll be kind of a theme basis around a lot of these conversations, uh, we're going to go off kilt a lot into stuff that people want to know about and generally give people an insight that they wouldn't get just from following their teams on Twitter and such, you know. Mm-hmm. Well said. Um, and in terms of getting in touch, then I suppose we have we don't even know exactly where this is going to be just yet um, at the point of recording. But at the very least, yeah, sure. um, we've each got a, a Twitter account we could be contacted on, I suppose. So um, mine is just at Lee Jones Esports. Do you want to, I don't know what yours is, Josh. You go for it. Uh, mine is at ICM Stella underscore Josh still just because uh, we we've still got the handle in all the cl- clients um, and bios and I don't want to change it because we'll <laughs> we'll lose all that otherwise at the moment. But um, I, I think we'll probably we'll probably set up a, our own uh, our own channel, especially YouTube and, and or whatever, and probably yeah. maybe its own Twitter account for the podcast, right? For as we go through, but um, yeah, for now it's probably the best place to see us. Yeah, for all we know, we're saying this, and you might you might there might be a description underneath wherever you're watching, and it'll say in there anyway. So we'll see um but yeah get in touch and obviously you know follow subscribe and all of that so you can see the next episode and as we said from now on we'll we'll try and get a guest on each time as well uh to kind of give a bit more insight and get get some experts on that can um yeah spread their knowledge of, of how everything works in the background so yeah. yeah cheers for listening and hope to see you next time thank you guys